From San Diego, California, this is a One Extraordinary Marriage Show. We're being busy is overdone, romancing is fun, and scheduling sex has taken the guesswork out of wondering when you're going to get some. I'm Tony DeLorenzo, your co-host, along with my beautiful wife, Elisa. From coast to coast and around the world, thank you for joining us. It's time to talk sex, love, and commitment. Give us a call or text us on the Hug Hotline at 858-876-5663 or send us an email to hugs at oneextraordinarymarriage.com. This is part one in our new series, Walking Our Faith, Getting Started. And as we start today's show, listen to this quote from Billy Graham. He said, our faith becomes stronger as we express it. Mm. And as we're talking about walking through our faith and what that looks like and walking out our faith, all of these different aspects, that expression Mm -hmm. is really going to be where we have so much impact. But first, we start each One Extraordinary Marriage show with a hug. And a hug's an opportunity for you to hear from someone else in the one family, someone whose marriage has had transformation. And this week's hug is brought to you by the Position of the Month Club. And we're going to be sharing more about this club and how it's transforming marriages a little bit later in the show. The hug itself comes from a direct message that we received on Instagram that said, good morning and thank you. I found your show about a year ago when my now fiance and I were starting to talk about getting married Mm. and very shortly we will be married. All my life I've wanted to be married, but the idea of sex scared me. I don't know why I was scared, but over the last year and a half, the fear has slowly turned to excitement and your show has been a huge part of that. Awesome. Thank you for talking so openly about sex and every aspect of marriage. You bring up topics that I never hear discussed in church or Christian circles, but they're so important. So thank you for being honest and vulnerable and for strengthening marriages. Thanks to you, my my fiance and I have lots of tools in our toolbox for every intimacy. We love your show and are excited to start the journey of our life together. And we're planning for an extraordinary marriage. And I can finally say that I'm excited to have sex with my husband. Thank you. Love you guys. Oh, that is awesome. And I love it because you know what? When we open up the discussion, Mm -hmm. we get open, we get honest, we get transparent. Lives are changed. There's breakthrough that happened. Fear, Fear gets broken. Anxiety goes away. I love it. And I just want to say, if you know people in your world that are are dating, moving towards engagement, or maybe they're even engaged, this show is also for them, mm-hmm. right? This couple that wrote in the hug, they're not the only ones who listen to the show who are in that dating and engaged stage of life. And like she said, they've got tools now for every intimacy in their marriage. And how many more marriages could be changed with that sort of success That's right. um, from the get-go? And as Tony said at the top of the show, we are talking about walking our faith. And, you know, when we got married, Tony and I had very little spiritual intimacy. Yeah. It it was, we were both raised Catholic, uh, but we had situations and circumstances in our lives in our um, high school and college years that were just kind of like, all right, you know what, we're done with that. Mm -hmm. And you know what, let's go into this because over the years, I think many of you know, and we've said it and we've shared it at times. We're Christian. We mm-hmm. are we are followers of Jesus. That's who we are. And yet our lives were not always this way. And I would even say where we are in our Christian faith today isn't where it was when we first followed Jesus mm-hmm. and started, you know, going down that route. So for myself, what do you want to say? Well, I just want to say, regardless of what your faith background is, mm-hmm. this series on spiritual intimacy and, and walking out faith, walking your faith in this is going to impact your marriage. So we're sharing our story, mm-hmm. apply it to your life. Yeah, exactly. So for myself, as Elisa shared, grew up Catholic. Yeah. My father came from Italy. So that it, it just in that alone, you you grew up Catholic. You know, got I, what was it confirmed when I was a child? Yeah, you had first communion. First bap- communion. You had baptism, communion, and confirmation is where your stumbling point was. Yeah. So, wh- where was my stumbling point? Confirmation. Confirmation. Yeah. So I was sixteen, and the year prior, and I'm just sharing because I want you guys to know where I was and and how I got to where I am today. Um, and so I was sixteen. I was going to get confirmed. The year prior, I went on a retreat. That was sort of like the culmination. I think it was the bishop didn't come to our town, so we waited. Anyways, he was coming to our town that year at 16, and the woman who was leading our confirmation deal, she said, oh, hey, everybody, you have to go through this again. By that time, I had gotten a job. I was scheduled to work, and I just said, hey, you know what? I did it last year, and I'm good. So what ended up happening, because I didn't go through that retreat again, I didn't get confirmed. And, And that was really a place in my life 
where authority really irked me. It really irked me and and I and I walked away and it was a hard conversation because I had to have the conversation with my mom and my dad to tell them I wasn't going to get confirmed. And I remember that still to this day. Um, and that's 30 years ago now, mm-hmm. how disappointed and frustrated my parents were with me. And I just held my ground and said, well, that's, that's where I am. Mm-hmm. And on my side of things, um, likewise, race Catholic, I actually made it through my confirmation class and was confirmed. Um, I was, my parents, they were, we were the family that was in church every Sunday, no matter what. Um, we always sat in the second pew on the left. Like I can still picture it. That was just like our pew didn't have our names on it, but I felt like It must have because nobody else sat there. And when I went away to college, I really was at this place where I'm like, you know what? I I, I remember saying to my parents, specifically to my dad, I'm like, that's your religion. This has nothing to do with me and I'm not going to church. Um, Similar to my dearly beloved husband, we were both kind of stinkers. We were. But differently though, my, my folks never went to church with me. I ended up actually getting into cycling when I was 14 years old. And Joe, um, the guy who got me in it, he would play at our Catholic church. He played guitar there. And I was dating his daughter. I was young and and stupid and shouldn't have been doing that, but I was. And they would go every Saturday night. And that's where I got in. And that's where I was in church. And like Elisa, though, I stepped out sooner. But through college... There was nothing. I actually, I actually had a meeting. My buddy Joe, who had me or didn't have me, but he was the one who got me to church most Saturday nights. And and um, but one of his buddies, Dave Wardell, was second in command or the second guy to Promise Keepers to uh, McCarthy. Bill McCartney at CU Boulder. I was a student at CU Boulder. I got to meet that guy in that whole Promise Keeper. Um, phenomenon that happened. Mm-hmm. I was right there. But even Dave came up to me and, and talked to me and I was like, dude, what you're offering me isn't worth it right now. Like mm-hmm. for me, I'd rather be party drinking and, and hanging out. And so there were some turbulent years, even when Elisa and I met in 1994 on the campus of CU Boulder. Absolutely. And, you know, so our our earlier, so we, here we come, you know, these two kids that were raised Catholic, we decide that we're going to get married. You know, Tony asks me to marry him. I'm like, yay, you know, get married. And then we have to figure out the whole ceremony thing, because keep in mind, we have two Catholic families on either side. Mm -hmm. And so Tony and I, in our 20 somethingness, you know, basically tell our early parents, 20 somethingness, <laughs> early 20 somethingness, uh, tell both of our parents, look, we're not getting married in church. We're going to get married at a winery and we're having a Methodist minister marry us preside over the wedding period. Yep. Like it, don't like it. This is what we're doing. Um, we were, Elisa said it the best. We were stinkers, especially when it came into this area of our spiritual intimacy. We were, we were very like, this is what we're doing mm-hmm. and you can either with our family, I, I will say we were very much a, either you can take it or leave it and that's your choice, but this is how we're rolling. And so those were the early years. Like we came into it with that kind of like, we, we didn't discuss faith. We didn't pray together. Mm-hmm. It, it was just kind of like, you know, we knew people that went to church, but you know, it wasn't our world. I mean, my parents have gone to church forever. So like we knew people. Right. But I'm thinking about our... Nobody in our inner circle. Inner circle. Nobody was Mm-mm. there. Okay. No. Mm-hmm. So so church was this thing on the peripheral. Faith was this th- thing on the peripheral. Like we knew about it, but it wasn't until 2000. Mm-hmm. Tony is hiking the Pacific Crest Trail. It's the first time in our married life. So we're, you know, three and a half years in. It's the first time in our married life that we're separated from each other. Not, not like a, an official separation. He's hiking the trail and I'm at home. Like right. that's what I mean by separate for a long duration of time, because I hiked from Mexico to Canada. For those of you who don't know, Pacific Crest Trail goes from Mexico to Canada here on the West coast, 2,658 miles. It took me four and a half months mm-hmm. to hike that. So we are away during that time. Interestingly enough, my mother-in-law, I, I love her to death. Um, she, she gave me the foot, the footsteps, footprints, footprints. poem. And, uh, you know, she would just be like, Tony, I'm praying for you from the time we mentioned it. She was, she was like my faith warrior. She was my prayer warrior. You know that she, she would just always be like, I'm praying for you, Tony. I'm like, good on you, mom. Thank you. And then, you know, footprints comes and, and I, I would have it and I kept it with me in my pack. And I would read that almost daily, I think, because there was always a time for me to just, um, journal or write. And I had that. And along that, 
trail, I came across this guy, Dave, um, from Arkansas around the 500 mark in Tehachapi. And here was a guy, Christian, um, but he didn't, he didn't like, Hey man, you need to, you need to be, you need Jesus. Right. He, he wasn't like that. He was actually going through a really tough time in his life. He had a landscaping business that was, uh, had turned South. He had just, uh, gone through a divorce mm-hmm. and he was in just a, a really interesting time of it in his life. And he just needed some clarity. And so I met him and Dave became, gosh, uh, uh, one of my best friends on the trail. Mm-hmm. He and I hiked from that point at a mile 500 in Tehachapi all the way into Canada together, 2,100 miles. And I'd get choked up because, you know, it, it was just, uh, what an experience. And I just remember at one point in time, we were talking about faith because I, I was re- there, was, there was really this stirring in my heart. Because when you're out alone, as, as much as we were, I mean, I hiked 20 miles a day, day in and day out for four and a half months. Um, you didn't see many people and you had a lot of alone time. And especially when you get into the high Sierras and you're at peaks around you that are, you know, 12, 13,000. Um, you have Mount Whitney, that's 14,000. The highest place that we crossed over was Forster Pass at 13,000 something feet. And you're out there. Even through that, even through the woods, the the creeks, the streams, the animals, and and there's just a stirring like there's more to this universe than just me. Because when you're sitting at the top of these peaks or these passes and you look up into the night sky and you see the billions and billions of stars, and you're just going, Wow, there's more to life than just me and my selfish ambitions. So that's where the stirring began for me. Well, and interestingly enough, we were having a parallel journey because while Tony was gone, I'm living in the apartment by myself and never forget one night. And I'd made all these plans that if Tony, when he was gone, if anything would ever happen, like I'm calling 911 and and I'm just going to like hunker down. Yeah. I mean, this was back in the day. I mean, (laughs) this was 2000. Right. And so sure enough, one night um, there is this like pounding on my front door and I immediately run to the front door because you know, every plan just flies out the window. window. Yeah. And I look out and there's three very, very large drunk men outside my apartment. And I, I recognize them. I know they live a few doors down, but in that moment they were so drunk that they just couldn't figure out why they couldn't get into an apartment that wasn't theirs. And from behind me, I heard this male voice that said this, like, turn around. This is not your apartment. And then I get freaked out. An audible voice. An audible voice. Like I heard a voice mm-hmm. and you know, in that moment, they like have this huge revelation. They look up, they're like, Oh, it's not our place. No wonder we can't get in. And I'm like, yeah, you idiot. No wonder you can't get in. And so they, they leave the next morning. I go out to, you know, get the newspaper and literally the entire locking mechanism, everything that kept them between, you know, them out and and me in and safe literally collapsed into the doorframe. And in that moment, putting, connecting the dots and, and you may not believe in, in Jesus and you may not believe in angels, but I will tell you, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that that was an angel that was sent to protect me that night. Mm-hmm. Because I will tell you three drunk men, one woman, if they'd gotten in, it would not have gone well for me. It, it just wouldn't have. And, and so in that moment, so Tony's having this experience on the trail. I'm having this experience at home and we're walking this parallel journey. But even when he comes back, we don't really talk about it. Right. And, and here's the interesting thing, though, too, for me, I was in Oregon and we were just on the flanks of um, Mount Jefferson. And Dave, after all these conversations, he just pulls out a little travel Bible for me to, that he had. And he, he just throws it my way and he goes, hey, read, uh, read John. And I'm like, who's John? All Good the, Catholic kid. Who's John? I'm like, who's John? And he goes, it's the fourth book. Just open it up and read it. And that night I read it and I gave it back to him. And so there, there, there was that moment for me where I was just like, oh, wow, what's what's happening? And then to hear from Elisa about this happening, because I didn't know, because I'm out on the trail. And, and, and it was after that, I think it was right after that, where I got into a town and Elisa told me about this incident. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, oh my gosh. And yet, like she said, I came back and we really didn't talk about it. We, we... We knew there was something, and yet we were just sort of like arm's distance or more away mm-hmm. about going down this road of talking about our spiritual intimacy, which is one of the six forms of spirit of our intimacies and should be discussed in your marriage, no matter 
what's your faith? If you have faith, if you don't, or if you're seeking, it's, it's something that we need to be discussing and looking at. Absolutely. And, you know, so Tony comes back and, and we end up finding a church in Orange County and we start going to church and, and we're, we're kind of like dipping our toes in the water, right? We're like, ah, let, let's, let's see how this feels. And it was amazing. And we got plugged in and, and yet there was still this sort of like, ah, I don't know what this faith thing looks like. And, and we were hearing things from, from sermons that would say, you know what, you as husband and wife, you need to get up early in the morning and you need to pray together. And we're like, I don't do anything that early. Like, what are you talking about? Or they'd say, you know what, make sure you pray together every night. You should be doing a devotional. And, and we'd try and, and we would fall asleep. And so we're, we're fig- trying to figure out what this faith thing looks like. We're trying to, to do all of the stuff, like check all the boxes. And yet there was still this gap to the point that when we were doing the 60 days of sex challenge, right? And at this point in time, we were plugged into a church, but we did the 60 days of sex challenge. And I'll never forget at one point in time, Tony's like, you know, we're doing this challenge. Like we should, we should make praying together part of the, part of the 60 days of sex challenge. And if you have ever heard a seven-year-old girl at a slumber party at like 2 a.m. giggling, that's exactly what bubbled out of me at that point in time. I couldn't contain myself. I thought it was the most hysterical thing that he would ever propose. And I just, I, I laughed great way to shut down intimacy with your spouse. I'm just saying, you know, and so that happened. And then like two weeks later, we're in the middle of the 60 days of sex challenge. We have a week where I get my period. Both kids get sick. Tony comes down with a viral migraine and I'm like, I'm done. Yeah. Got nothing. And Tony, like after all of that reaches over, you know, it's been a week and he reaches over and he's like, Hey, we're still in the 60 days of sex challenge. And I remember laying there and I'm like, God, if this is going to happen, it is going to, in my head, this is going to happen because of you. Cause I got zero desire. It's up to you to shift the desire thing right here. And I'm like, Whoa, what's going on here? And, and I did like the desire came back. And afterwards I told Tony and he's like, you did what you prayed for desire. And then he's like, wait a minute, that actually worked. Right. So we, we, we share all of this story because we think it's important that you know who's behind these microphones. Tony and Elisa have not always been in church, right? We haven't always been doing devotionals. We haven't always gotten the spiritual intimacy thing right. We're just like all of you. But you got to know our story to know it because a lot of you are like, oh, they're in church every Sunday and they pray together and they serve together. That's been a journey. Mm-hmm. And just like it is for, for those of you in the one family, we know based on what you shared with us that, that 77% of you do go to church together of the ones that responded. 33% though of you pray together. Mm-hmm. There's a bit of a gap there. Mm-hmm. Bit of a gap there. Well, I I would say praying is probably one of the most intimate things you can do with your spouse, and it it, it truly is. And Elisa and I have gone and ebbed and flow through this at different times in different ways. So totally feel like right now we're sort of in between that. Like we're we're in, we're in church together, praying together. It ebbs and flows. And we are going to, in this series, we are going to be discussing praying together because mm-hmm. I would actually even go so far when you talk about how intimate it is, I would say it can actually be more intimate than having sex mm-hmm. with your spouse. Uh, and, and to that point, 85% of you would like to see prayer, prayer time and devotions having a bigger role in your marriage, but you're getting stopped by things like not knowing how to start or having different beliefs or wanting the other person to take the lead Mm -hmm. or feeling inadequate to your spouse's knowledge of faith or scripture. Or in some of you, you know, I I love the honesty in this group because you're like, you know what? I just don't feel like we have the time Mm -hmm. or we're not making it a priority. And you know, this idea of spiritual intimacy of, of sharing your faith journey of sharing your faith beliefs Like Tony said at the top of the show, this is one of the six intimacies. So we need to figure out how to make it work in marriage because many of you have told us when you first did the intimacy lifestyle, when you first started talking about money, that was awkward. Mm -hmm. It was hard to make it a priority. And yet you figured out how to have success in those areas. So let's take a look at this. Let's take a look at how you can then start to bring this, that same success in areas like sex and finance and bring it into your spiritual intimacy. Mm-hmm. And, and we want to talk about what this looks like for the, for the two of you. But first we want to thank this week's sponsor and that's the position of the month club. And the position of the month club is the number one community for couples who want better sex in and out of the bedroom. 
right? Because sex is not just for the bedroom folks. Position of the Month Club is a community of folks who uplift and encourage one another, who are willing to be vulnerable and take off the masks about all areas of their marriage in order to strengthen their connection and their relationship. And we are seeing tremendous, uh, the connections that are happening right now in the Position of the Month Club and how the marriages are being transformed is seriously, it's mind blowing. Mm -hmm. If you had asked us when we started this club a couple years ago, where it would be here in, in 2019, I, I couldn't even dream the connections, how couples are staying in because they're finding other people to, to share their victories with, with how they're, they're getting plugged in because you know what, after having babies, they're like, ah, how do we do this marriage thing? And they're finding other couples. They're like, here's an idea. Let's do this together. Let's, let's encourage one another. Well, they're actually even going and meeting each other because they're finding out where they're at. And these couples are getting together. Like you, you want to have an extraordinary marriage. You surround yourself with other marriages that are going after the extraordinary. So true. So true. But don't take just their word for it. Find out for yourself how the position of the month club can transform your marriage. Check it out at position of the month club.com. Cause it's more than just a new position each month. It's the resources and the community that matter. So join now at position of the month club.com. And so here we are, right? You, you've heard a lot about our journey and it has been, it has been a roller coaster, right? When I look back at, at that, you know, 18 year old girl who told her dad that she hadn't been to church in, you know, three months since he dropped her off at college. I really mm -hmm. thought my dad was going to have a heart attack to, to the woman now that actually serves, mm -hmm. serves at a church and, and is responsible for, for discipling other people. Like, I, I didn't know what that journey was going to look like. And let's let's not also discount, though, the journey of our faith over the years of our marriage. There are times when we were in churches that didn't fit well for one or the other. And how do we deal with that? Mm -hmm. You know, so we've had to, we've had a lot of areas that we've had to address with our spiritual intimacy. And just like any other, the conversations need to happen. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it can be frustrating. Sometimes it can be really frustrating because one spouse is all in and the other one isn't. Sometimes it's like, hey, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. And yet, you know what? I'm just not in it. You know, I, I don't connect with people. We haven't met anybody or I mm -hmm. haven't met anybody or I've gone I, or I've gotten offended. Oh, it happens in church. It happens. <laughs> Been there, done that, you know, and had to work through it in the forgiveness and, and all that. So it's a conversation, mm -hmm. right? It all starts with that conversation, that emotional intimacy. Are we willing to be open, honest, and transparent about this area of our life without, you know, with our spouse, you know, without fear or repercussion that they're going to be all bent out of shape. Mm -hmm. And that's a big one because I remember at one point in time we were at a church and I, and I remember like, this isn't where I need to be. Like mm -hmm. I'd rather be doing like, this is at the point in time in my life, I was riding a lot. And I remember just going like, I could honestly be on my bike and be much, much happier. Like let, let's just call it good. And I remember the, the frustration I was going through and how was I going to bring this up to Elisa? Mm -hmm. So it, it's real. It happens. And you're not alone. And you, you all, regardless of, of what your faith journey is, you're going to have challenges to your faith, right? I will tell you that oh, when yes. our son Andrew died, that there was a, there was a severe shaking of our faith. You, there was, there have been seasons when we've lost homes and stuff like that, where, where our faith has been tested. Mm -hmm. You know, what are we going to hold on to? What is that going to look like? And, and like Tony said, it starts with those conversations, right? What is, what are we crafting in terms of spiritual intimacy in our marriage? And then as you start to have those conversations, you, you realize that you need to, you need to be aware of the expectations that you have for your spouse, because a lot of, you know, how do you expect them to act, right? Do you want them to lead prayer time? Do, do you want them to make sure that everybody's ready to go to church on time? Do you want to make sure that, you know, do you have an expectation that, you know, the two of you are going to sit down and pray together in the morning or at night or at lunch or whatever it is? You all know that when we talk about expectations, they become frustration if they're not voiced. And that's very, very true when it comes to spiritual intimacy. And, and it's also going, okay, where, where can we start, right? Can we start with a conversation about what this is going to look like? Can we choose one day a week that we are going to pray together? And maybe you start off praying silently together and down the road, you have the, the, the hope that your journey is going to have you praying out loud for each other. Mm-hmm. Or maybe it's a devotional in the evening, mm -hmm. 
You know, where, where does that look like? You know, for Elisa and I, I remember back in the day, one of the first devotionals we ever did was called Nightlight. And that was six years into our marriage. Mm-hmm. Let me be real clear. That was six years. And, and it was one of the best things. Like, and, and we've come and gone with the devotionals, but I think for Elisa and I personally, that was a great getting started point mm-hmm. for us. And, and even to this day, I, I love when we do our devotional time because it's usually a one page. It's, it's a it's a good read. Then we get into the word and we do our own things separately. But getting started for us, that was a great first step. You know what? I'll make sure to find that and I'll put that in the episode notes. So that way you guys can check out that one and maybe one or two other ones that we've done over the years. I'll, I'll put those here in the episode notes. Just it, it's a great little I think even right now, we do our devotionals at night. It takes us no more than 10 minutes. Would you say? Yeah. I mean, it's just no more than 10 minutes, but it's that time together that we make, you know? It's it's looking at this because we know with with the almost 10 years that we've been recording the One Extraordinary Marriage Show, we know that we have all different kinds, all, all different faiths represented in this listening audience. We know that you've told us that that these are your journeys, Mm-hmm. And, and so again, I'm going to say, just, just take the parts that apply to your marriage, right? If you have different faith beliefs, talk about them. Just like that quote from Billy Graham that talks about how we, we deepen our faith. And I'm looking for it right now. Our faith becomes stronger as we express it. Be willing to have the conversations this week with your spouse, mm. regardless of where you are on the faith journey. Choose to say, you know what? We're going to go deeper this week. I'm going to make the decision to emotionally connect to you so that we have a deeper level in our marriage. And I mentioned it before, but it bears repeating again. When you all first started the intimacy lifestyle, it was awkward and uncomfortable. When you think about different positions, it's like, oh, that could be awkward and uncomfortable. I don't know how it's going to work. Okay, but you've done it. So don't, don't give me the excuses on why you can't have this conversation with your spouse, because I know you, and I know that if you can do it when it comes to sex, you can do it when it comes to spirituality. Mm-hmm. I'm not buying the excuses. You want to be extraordinary. You're going to take a step that you haven't taken before to have a marriage that you haven't had before. Yeah. And so as you begin, and we begin this series as well, like start the conversation. That, that, that's the place to go right now. Just start the conversation. And maybe you, you've been in church your whole life, your whole marriage. And yet there's some like friction going on. Just like it could be in your sexual intimacy, your financial intimacy, your recreational intimacy. Let's have that conversation this week. You know, pick one thing like, hey, honey, let's do one devotional. Hey, let's pray silently together once a week. Whatever that may be for you guys, Go for it. Maybe this week, in all honesty, you need to share with one another your faith journey. What's it look like? Maybe you know it. You know what they've gone through, but do you really? And maybe it just might spark some some faith again, some belief again, some like, wow, I can't believe where I've been and where I've gone and where I've come from. I don't, I don't know, but I, I do know just sharing with you guys, with the one family where Elisa and I have come from. I know that we're truly blessed to have you part of the one family and that we get to live life because of our Lord and Savior. I just, I just do. It's just part of my being. I may not be the guy who can, who can quote scripture because I'm not, I can read it. I know where it is. Um, but I'm not that guy who's going to quote scripture to you unless I have it right in front of me, but I do have faith in me to know and believe that my Lord and Savior has so much for each and every one of us. We love you guys. Have a fantastic week as you dive into your spiritual intimacy. And next week, we are going to be going into part two of Walking Our Faith, Beliefs About Spiritual Intimacy. Love you guys. Have a fantastic week, and we'll catch you next week. Love you guys.